Hey everyone, let's start the video on putting this 340 horsepower beast into the uh, second gen Toyota MR2. Today's episode is all going to be about getting this prep, attaching the transmission, everything that involves, all the trimming and whatnot that we have to do around here. We're going to talk about some of the components that get attached onto it. First thing we got to do is this hole right here is not threaded from the factory. As I've just noticed, on some engines it's a bit smaller than others. All the ones I've seen until this one, they were big enough that you could just run the uh, helical tap straight into it. But if you look here, it doesn't fit. That, that's not going to work. The hole is 11.8 millimeters and this needs a 12.25 millimeter hole. Not a big deal. We're going to drill it out. It's always a good idea on a hole like this where you're trying to follow a hole to use a chamfer bit. And we're going to take it in two steps just to make it more likely that it stays aligned. A little bit of oil, a little on the tap, and go on in. A tap handle helps tremendously to keep this straight, but also what helps even more is that leading chamfer. Go until you find the bottom. Try not to hit the bottom too hard. And there's our hole. Let's get an insert in there. And by the way, this is just the off-brand uh, recoil. The helical ones have a much nicer starting tool, especially if you haven't done this a bunch. I'd suggest the actual proper helical tool. In. All right, now grab an M12 bolt and check, make sure it fits. It bolted nicely, which means you got one last thing to do now. There's the tang at the bottom that you use to install it. You need to break it. Next, clean all the chips you have over here. And with that step done, we need to worry about the transmission actually bolting onto this engine. There's a couple things that need to be clearanced. Before we can do that, we need to make sure we have a dowel pin. You can see there's one in this location right here and one in this location right here. They can be in the transmission, but you need to have both of those. To make this easier, I've actually got the front half of the case. I don't expect that most people will have this, but it certainly makes the job easier. And you'll see that it doesn't quite clear. You'll want to make some marks right here and down here. This needs to be cut off, and then right here. You can go from these marks to make at least your first attempt instead of throwing the transmission on there for yourself. So we're going to take the transmission off, and we're going to clean those up. My tool of choice, angle grinder with a flap wheel. Uh, in this case, it's a 36 grit, but it honestly doesn't matter that much. And that should be good. Let's try to put it back on there. And it's not super clear there, but you get the idea. You've got a transmission there, just grind until it fits. This bolt hole does get used. So that one, you don't want to cut too narrow around it, but this ear down here, you can completely lop it off. This hole doesn't get used, so you can even go flush with that. There's no reason to be shy on that stuff. So, and that brings us to the other side of the motor. We can see the motor mount wants to go here. So this ear here on the motor needs to be lopped off. Uh, there's a threaded hole there, but it doesn't get used in our application, so don't worry about it. Up here, you can see where the slave cylinder mounts. It gets awfully tight in this area, and there's a little bit of clearance here. Now, something else I want to talk about. The reason I left this stock manifold, you can see it just barely clears the clutch, but then there's going to be cables coming in here and here. They're going to hit right on the catalytic converter. Really, if you need the catalytic converter on this motor, you're going to need to fabricate something here. There's a whole pile of different exhaust manifolds available, and the pattern is the same on both sides. So you can try different ones, see maybe you can find something that fits better for this application. As far as the clutch goes, you could do away with just heat shield, but that's not your only problem here. So anyways, let's get to grinding. Looks like I'm still hitting right in this area. No big deal, just clearance it out. And that kind of stuff you can do with a die grinder once the transmission's installed. You don't have to do this all the time. Yeah, and it looks like we've got plenty of clearance now. And now we get to start the assembly proper. So make sure you clean all the schmoo off of here. Let's hang our flywheel. Next thing, 
this is sure to have a debate in the comments. I'm always a fan of using Loctite on these bolts. Now what you have to consider, the holes in the crank right on the other side of that is a main journal. So you really don't want to go heavy. You want just the tiniest drop on there. You really don't want any of that stuff making it into the crankcase. They're just on hand tight right now. I'm alone here today, so I'm gonna use one of these can't twist clamps. This is much easier if you just have somebody else. And I'm gonna lock it in there into one of the starter teeth so that I can torque this thing. We're gonna do this in a couple steps. First, we're gonna go to 30 foot pounds. This is more about making sure that everything is seated. Then we're gonna go up to 50. And then finally, the final torque of 75 foot pounds. If your intent is to set a comment section on fire, don't remove this green stuff. Fidanza suggests you actually do remove it though. It just comes off real easy. Next, we need clutch disc and the pressure plate. So just make sure you clean this off. The ACT kits come with an alignment tool. There's not actually a pilot on this thing, so it's not actually going to align it properly. But if nothing else, it at least holds it somewhat in place while you're doing the rest of the stuff. Then before we tighten any of these, what we're gonna do just kind of eyeball it right in the center. Because there's no pilot bearing, it's a little more forgiving when you're installing the transmission. These are going to 18 foot pounds. You want to lube up the splines on the clutch disc. This will stop them from wearing out prematurely. All right, let's mount the transmission. Last minute check before we install the transmission. Uh, your clutch kit will come with a new throttle bearing. Make sure you install that. This one's got low miles, so I'm going to keep it on there. It's only got about 300 miles. Make sure you've got the appropriate number of dowel pins. In this case, it's two. One goes here and one goes here. In my case, I've got them both on the engine and you're going to have one bolt in hand so that you can bolt things together once you get it in there. This really helps to have two people, especially with this heavy beast. Just stab it in there. There we go, we got both dowel pins lined up. Just kind of walk the transmission in the rest of the way. Where you can, you want to avoid sucking them together with the, uh, with the bolts. You just kind of want to wiggle it in. I've got one bolt near each uh, dowel pin. At this point, we've definitely got everything mated. We can grab a 17 millimeter wrench and take it in the rest of the way. Let's cover where all the mounting bolts go. This is a newer E153. We'll cover the older one in a second. First, there's three M10 by 1.25, 55 millimeters long, here, here, and down here, and 70 millimeters long, still an M12 by 1.25, up here. Three M10 by 35 millimeters. There's one that goes right here, and then at the bottom here, and then on the other side of the flywheel opening, there's another one. And let's bring back this guy to talk about the older transmission. The older transmission is gonna be missing a bolt hole up here for the M12. This one's still here, this one's still here, and this one's still here. Then for the M10s, you'll notice you still have this one right here, but the two down here are missing. It's a little light on mounting, but nobody's claimed to have an issue so far. If you're concerned, you can get the front half of the transmission from a Solara and it'll have these mounting patterns. And at the same time, that Solara transmission will get you the 3.9 final drive, which is really nice to have. And in fact, the Solara has all of the same one through five gear ratios as the E153, except it's got the slightly taller final drive, which is nicer to drive, and it'll have the newer bell housing. So if you wanna make a hybrid transmission, that's good. Just remember, since you're using the, uh, the mid case from the MR2 and this one from the Solara, you're gonna have to reshim your shafts. All right, let's torque everything down. These M12s go to 55 foot-pounds, and the M10s go to 30 foot-pounds. All right, that's all it. Next thing we're concerned about is the axle stubs. So the left one just snaps right in as stock. Um, a little trick on that one, if you leave the snap ring opening towards the bottom when you're slipping it in, it'll usually go in a lot easier. And then we have the right side axle shaft. Now, 
this becomes the site of our next problem. We need a support from this bearing to that bolt pattern right there. The stock carrier support has an issue. 2GR block is wider than the 3S GTE, so the distance from here to here is too much. There's no room for an adapter. The next problematic one, I know I talked about this in the introduction video as if it would work, and I apologize, I should have researched further. This is off of a Venza, it's off of a U660 transmission. This has the same issue, but for a different reason. The U660 transmission's output is further away from the motor. So if you bolt this on, even though the bolt pattern matches, it pushes the axle too far out. Now the tricky part about this is you can actually get that axle in. You need a light tap of a mallet to get it in and you're rubbing right here against the differential case and that's going to cause a lot of friction when you're driving and will probably put metal dust inside your transmission. So don't use a U660 mount. Which leaves us with the early mount from an Avalon. I believe as long as you're using something that came with a U141 transmission, you'll be fine. So let's put this on here and check it out. As we can see with the Avalon mount, the axle shaft actually slides in, no mallet required. So this, as far as the position in space here, is good. It's not perfect. If you shave two and a half millimeters off of the back of this flange to send it inboard, it'll actually be straighter. If you're racing it, that might make it so you're not generating quite as much heat in the transmission, and it's probably worth it. Honestly, for street use, people have been running them like this for 10 years. There's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of miles on these with no reported failures, so I wouldn't worry about it too much. Now, you'll notice this snap ring here won't go on. The bearing is standing too far out, so the bearing actually needs to go a little bit further in. On the website, I advertise a service for this, but most local machine shops should be able to do that. And this is what you're looking to get done. Um, you're gonna need a spacer right here, and a new circlip groove. Now, as far as the thickness for the spacer and how far you move this over, there's a couple different configurations. This is the six and a half millimeter configuration. This works as long as you're using an LSD shaft inside of an LSD transmission. It should also be the one that works as long as you've got an open differential with an open differential shaft. Let's install it. And before we install it, we wanna put in a new bearing with a part number right here. When you're looking at your bearing and trying to decide whether or not it's good, keep in mind, this is somewhat of a self-aligning bearing. I really can't show it on video, but it does twist back and forth. That's normal. Let's get this on. And then all there's left to do is to install the shaft. And then we just install the snap ring. This bolt right here is what goes in here and retains the shaft. I've seen a lot of damaged bearings that come in on, on people that want these modifications that they didn't use the bolt with their little rubber on the end of it, it just destroys the bearing. These bolts are reusable, but usually if you're not careful, you'll lose the piece of rubber when you're taking it out or somebody else has done you the courtesy of losing it for you. The bolt costs less than $2 at Toyota. Just go get it. And then you don't have to worry about how tight you put this in. You just put it in until it bottoms out. It's made to be just the right length. And finally, if you haven't done it yet, you should clean the outside of the stubs. Um, it'll be a lot easier to do now than when you're underneath the car. And there we go. Now we've got our stubs in. Now would be a good time to mount the alternator. Something else to mention about the alternator. There are several people that complain that it squeaks when it's idling. This alternator is supposed to have a one-way clutch in here and you'll want to check it. A lot of these, by the time they've sat in a junkyard for a while, they're actually seized. And this build video, to keep things simple, we're not putting air conditioning on. So the belt we need is this guy. And keep in mind, this is a six rib. This is a seven rib motor. You're driving a water pump and an alternator. There's no need for seven ribs. Nothing special about the routing. Since there's missing rib, make sure you leave the missing rib at the same spot everywhere. I just put the belt all the way back and that works for me. And there you go, there's your belt routing. And now the headers. And now let's get the motor mount on. Now something to note, the price recently dropped dramatically on these. They used to be 620, now they're 350. The reason for that is they used to be a fully machined piece and now they are a cast piece. One of the disadvantages of the cast piece is it has to have draft angle, otherwise you can't get it out of the mold. That means this thing fits just fine. Previously, the fully machined part was a lot easier to get the belt off. Um, you'll notice some of these, and some of these are better than others, 
but overall you might actually want to take a minute with a uh, sander or a file and make it so that you can take the belt off and as you can see it only took a quick minute on the uh, sander taking about two and a half maybe three millimeters off uh, there's three different size fasteners on this thing you've got the uh, the 55 millimeter 55 millimeter fastener that goes up here then the 100 millimeter fastener that goes there and the 90 millimeter fastener that goes there If you want to torque these, 50 foot-pounds. Now, if you've got an older motor, this VVTi line will have this rubber section in the middle, and these are known for failing. If you've got the rubber line, it's, it's not really optional. You should do it, and it's not possible to replace this thing in the chassis. And just to hold the line in place, it, it's easier just to kind of put this hand tight in there. And the Crush washers under there, it's not acceptable to reuse them. They're not expensive. Just buy some. I have to admit a failure here. Uh, Toyota called for a different crush washer at top than at the bottom. And the one at the top was just kind of convenient. It has, it holds both of them together at the same time. And I just assumed that getting a bag of 10 of these uh, other ones was just cheaper and they use the same bolt and it's the same pipe. So surely they would fit. But it turns out the hole up here has a bigger tolerance. And if you use the uh, little ones up there, uh, you can see, well, it's, you probably can't see it on video, but it's possible to leave part of the pipe open. So that's not acceptable. The uh, top one here is not going to get put on because I'm going to have to order the right gasket. But I'm not going to delay putting the rest of this together. And if your left side mount is not on at this point, now's the time to put it on because we're almost ready to start putting this in the car. Uh, the other thing we haven't covered is the dipstick should go back in. It does clear the headers. It's just really hard to install the headers with it in the way. The fact that the intake manifold is missing is intentional because the wiring harness goes underneath here as well as the fuel system. So we're going to get that once it's in the car. And at this point, we're ready to install it. So since I'm waiting for these gaskets, I'm going to call this a good time to end the, this video. And uh, next video, I think we're going to be uh, preparing the chassis and hanging the motor. All right. See you guys in the next video. Thanks.